Hello everyone, today we have with us Dr. Lars Reiten from Karolinska Institute, Sweden. Thank you sir for joining us. Oh, thank you. So for the first question that I would like to ask you is, can you brief us about the recent advances in incretin based therapies? Uh, the most uh, interesting results are those from the GLP-1 receptor agonist trials. One uh, with uh, lixacenatide uh, and another with semaglutide actually showing the leader trial and the sustained six trial, showing that you actually can reduce morbidity and mortality by means of uh, adding these drugs to conventional treatment of people with type 2 diabetes who are either uh, already stricken by cardiovascular disease or at a very high risk to develop cardiovascular disease. And the results came after relatively short testing periods of approximately two in between two and three years. And uh, there was about a 14% mortality reduction. In relative speaking, in absolute terms, about 2%. And um, together with the success of SGLT2 inhibition with empagliflozin, these two studies, I think, uh, causes a sort of landmark shift in the treatment of people with diabetes at high cardiovascular risk. So, talking about geriatric patients, what is the incretin-based therapy suitable for management of diabetes in these patients? Uh, well, geriatric and geriatric, I think that you have to evaluate each patient uh, on his own or her own. Uh, you can be rather old uh, in a number of years and still relatively young, mm -hmm. or you can be rather stricken by disease and, and disasters, although you are not too old. So it's a relative thing. In principle, incretin-based uh, therapy should be quite useful in elderly patients. And uh, maybe the first thing to observe is their kidney function, because uh, this type of treatment has not been tested in people with um, severe kidney di uh, disease, uh, G GFR, glomerular filtration rate mm -hmm. below 30, for instance. They can easily be used if you are, let's say, below 60, 60 to 40 or so. Uh, otherwise, I think they can be used to elderly people, like to younger people. So since we know that lifestyle or dietary modifications are quite necessary in diabetic patients, so which guidelines would you recommend for uh, regarding diets in diabetes patients to prevent other diseases? Yeah, in principle, lifestyle advice is the first thing you do when you see a patient with type 2 diabetes. Uh, and what is lifestyle? You shouldn't smoke. That is obligatory. Very difficult for some to stop. They shouldn't smoke. Uh, secondly, they have to move around. Uh, I think at least three hours of brisk walking or the equivalent each week is a minimum. And weight reduction is also important. But in principle, in my clinical experience and that of others, to get people to reduce weight is relatively or very difficult. The easiest way is to say you have to, to start to move around uh, and then at least try not to gain weight anymore. Having said that, if you have truly obese people, re really obese, then you can also consider uh, some sort of gastric intervention, uh, surgical procedure, to help people to get down in weight, but that is for the super high weight yes. people. So in uh, non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus patients, how can we attain near normalization of diurinal uh, glucose concentration? Non-insulin dependent, yeah. In the beginning of the disease, it is relatively easy if you use available tools, always starting with metformin, use that to a reasonable dose, let's say one gram per day, possibly not more than that, and then add on treatment uh, relatively quick. It seems uh, to me that people give one drug, lifestyle advice, one drug, and then they wait too long. The, uh, today we have much more drugs to choose from. Incretins, for instance, 
uh, GLP-1 uh, receptor agonists, uh, we can actually choose a variety of drugs and combine them in, in a very good way. And uh, the key here is to see the patient often, to, to let the patient monitor their own glucose levels and, and really to instruct them how important it is. And for a non-insulin dependent person with type 2 diabetes, I think you should at least aim for a glycated hemoglobin of around 7. If you can, lower, but, but at least that. So Dr. Lars, can you highlight on the potential of gut hormones, glucagon-like peptide for clinical use? Oh, the glucagon-like peptide, the GLP-1 receptor agonists firsthand, uh, have really been shown to be life-saving and, and uh, decrease the number of, of myocardial infarctions, possibly also stroke. Uh, peripheral artery disease, the necessity of in coronary in interventions in, this, in, in the SUSTAIN-6 trial with semaglutide. Uh, Short-acting uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists seem to be less efficient. So if you are using one, use one who has a long duration of action, at least 24 hours, maybe a week, that are available on the market. And uh, they are relatively easy to use. The patient doesn't mind too much to give an injection. You have to inject them. Uh, if you have a patient with insulin, uh, it may result in a reduced uh, need for the dose of insulin and weight reduction and less hypoglycemia. So there are many benefits besides the mortality saving and so on. Thank you so much, Dr. Lars, for joining us and today. Thank you. To stay updated on our latest scaled videos and interviews, please follow us on Twitter, like us on our Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Happy Doc Flexing!